So, hey, my name is Patrice Roy. So, uh, I don't see you. I hope you see me. Uh, and, and welcome to my talk. So, I've been invited uh, during the uh, last fall to give a talk, and they asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, let's try something. Let's grow a smart pointer together. So who am I? As you heard, I do many things. I have a number of kids, <clears throat> uh, which might explain some background, uh, background noises because I'm working from home like everyone else. I have a number of animals, which might also explain some background noises. So if you hear birds chirping loud or dogs barking, I'm, I'm very sorry, but that's the setting in which I am right now. And I used to do flight simulators and uh, research and other stuff. And I've been teaching for a while. And yeah, I'm busy. <clears throat> so. What are we going to do today? We're going to first discuss slightly what we mean by smart pointer. There's the word responsibility that will come up. We'll discuss that. Um, check what smart pointers do these days and what niches uh, could be filled still. And then we'll grow one. We'll, we'll write one together. Um, and hopefully uh, showing you a few cute tricks and then think about what we just did. Let's hope we can fit this into an hour or so. There. So what do we have in mind? I, I tried to put slides that had something that looks like growing stuff, but uh, the gardener at home is my wife. <coughs> so first of all, if you don't mind, pointers are not bad. I keep hearing that pointers are bad. Uh, they are our enemies. They're actually very well behaved and very nice. They're quite useful. There's a lot of, of fear, understanding, and doubt with respect to, to raw pointers, but pointers by themselves, they don't leak. They're pretty nice objects. They're very simple. They're very easy to copy and everything. So you can write code like this, you know, where P points to a, um, a raw character string and output it, and there's no link. There's no link in the code because it didn't allocate anything by yourself, so you don't have anything to free. So you can use pointers in nice code in a safe way. Well, people sometimes, I have students who think this, this leaks because there's a pointer. It doesn't. That's perfectly fine. Likewise, you can write code like this, a function that takes an array of sorts, and iterate through it using a pointer. In this case, I wrote auto, but P is a pointer. And, and I go through each element of the array. It's a pretty nice loop. It works. And there's no leak because there's no allocation. So that's fine. So we can, we can use raw pointers, even though that's not the subject of the talk today. The problem when we are, when we are using raw pointers, it's, it's who's responsible for the point T. And sometimes that's obscured or, or unknown looking at the source code. That's where the problem comes from. So if you look at this really, really, really mean bit of code there, for a few seconds, you might feel queasy or bad. And if you do, well, that's fine, because this, this leaves a number of, of open questions with respect to what's right and what's wrong. It might be completely right. It might be completely wrong. We have no way of telling. So, there's many ways this could go wrong. See, if you look at this, you have f returning an x star. So we don't know where star p comes from, where the point t comes from. Is it C++ code? Is it something done in C or some other language? Something managed by the OS? And we don't know, looking at the source code, where it comes from. So what we should be able to do with it is unclear. We don't know if GFP we'll call delete on P. And if it does, what will be the consequence of the second delete afterwards? It's unclear, we don't see it. We don't know if G of P would throw. And if it does, were we supposed to free P? It's unclear. We don't even know if we're supposed to do this. We don't know if it's our responsibility as calling code to be deleting P because we don't know where it comes from and what our role with respect to P is. We don't know if it was allocated through new, in which case maybe delete would make sense. If it was allocated through new square brackets, in which case delete like this is bad, because it would require the square brackets too. We don't know if it was allocated with malloc or something else. It's really much obscured. We don't know. And the fact that we don't know makes coding difficult. That's the problem, not the pointers themselves. So we don't even know if it was actually dynamically allocated at all. See, these two cases are quite possible. The first one would make the delete in main reasonable. The second one would make it a bit painful. Now, the consequences of the second one would be 
hard to uh, to fathom. So 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 the 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 obscuredness of raw pointers is the problem in this case. And, and on top of that, if we have a function like this, we don't know if the caller will actually free the memory. It's unclear because the responsibility is not clear. We could make no discard apply to f to make sure that the caller does something with the return value, but that would not ensure it would delete the thing at the end. No. So using raw pointers on the boundaries of function, boundaries of interfaces, it's a bit of a repetitive thing, but still, it's tricky because the responsibilities with respect to the point here are unclear. That's the issue in this case. So the key, the, the, that small dot there, the key benefit of smart pointers is that they encode the responsibility with respect to the point T into the type. So let's put it in both both, both, both face. That's the key point. When we use smart pointers, we encode responsibility with respect to the point T into the type system. So the responsibility becomes clear. Small after effect, you write less comments because what you're doing is clearer. So you don't have to explain it to people, at least less often. So responsibility, what do I have in mind with this now? What we have in mind in this case is the rules or matter of ownership. Who owns the resource? Who owns the point T? And what happens when that owner is being copied or moved or whatever? So in C++ terms, this is pretty much what we have in mind. No copying, moving, destroying. The ownership, what happens to the point T when the, point, the, when the owner, the smart pointer, is being uh, performing one of these operations. Because they are objects, the smart pointers, the fact that they have well-defined responsibility over the point T, it means that when you have uh, when you write your own classes and you're using smart pointers inside instead of raw pointers, you have typically less management to do because you know what you're doing already. It's being taken care of by that thing inside you, which is smarter than the raw pointer. I, I put two links there that you can look. I'm going to give the slides to my friends uh, in Munich, but I can show you the code right away if you don't mind. Uh, I put them in... Oh, sorry, too many windows open. I'm going to get the right window for you, my friends. Where did I put it? There we go. So I, I, I wrote two small dynamically allocated arrays there with fixed sizes to keep the example small. Okay. I won't go through all of the code with you because I gave a link. You can actually try it and play with it. It's simple. It's a dumb vector that does not do pushback or anything, just for the special functions. So I call this array with a big A. I did the standard type aliases that we tend to find in those containers. Since it doesn't grow, I just kept two. Uh, data members, one for the pointer to the first element and one for the number of elements, as it won't change in this case. I wrote some boilerplate code, size, begin, end, and stuff. Simple stuff. And I did the management. Oops, I don't know if I'm getting a chat right now or something. I hope you're seeing the screen. Well, yeah, so, so simple management of code like this with new uh, calls to algorithms, so simple code. Uh, the basic exception handling required to make the code stable if there's a, a problem, in this case using fill, where you're doing assignments of T to T and something throws along the way and you have to uh, clean up your own stuff. So just without going into the small details, if I go to the end of the array class where I'm doing the manual management of code, I'm at line seven in this case. So I'm allocating with new, freeing with delete, well, deletes, uh, new, uh, new square brackets and these square brackets, and just doing the basic stuff for the, the six uh, special functions of C++, copy, move, uh, default constructor, and uh, destructor. If I do the same thing with a smart pointer, using a unique pointer inside to make sure that the memory is being managed by the array, Again, all of this code is made available to you through the link. Same kind of thing, but the biggest change is I'm using a unique pointer in there instead of using a raw pointer. The rest of the code is essentially the same thing, except that I'm not managing the memory myself. It's being handled by that smart pointer in there. If 
take the one with fill that I had a few seconds ago. I'll bring it back so that you can see it, if you don't mind. There we go. But I did manual memory management. I had this try thing there. Why did I have this? It's because it's an array of T. And once I have allocated that array of T there, the raw one, I become responsible for it. I'm owner of that memory. But since it's a raw array, I have to manage memory myself. Phil does assignments. It assigns a T to a T in this case. Since I don't know what an assignment of a T to a T does, it might throw, which means I have to recuperate in this case and clean up the array because there won't be any destructor being called since the constructor has not concluded. This is a lot of boilerplate code. It does work. It's fine, but it's non-trivial for some people. If I do the same thing with the unique pointer instead, I, you only see that fill call. There's no try, catch, dot, 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 whatever. Why is that? It's because this array there is already handled by a smart pointer. Whereas if there's an exception along the way, that object having been constructed already, it will be destroyed. The owner has not completed construction. The array constructor there is not done. So it won't be destroyed, but the data members inside will. So I'm simpli simplifying my life because the boilerplate code is gone. It's under the ends, or in the ends of that responsible object, that smart pointer. So I had seven lines when I stopped. And in this case, if I go down, I'm at 53. That's uh, just about a 24% improvement in terms of code size without any loss of size or efficiency, essentially, in this case. It's actually pretty neat. So just with the basic boilerplate code, there's a significant, I think, 24% reduction of code size, so less code to manage and everything, and all of the explicit uh, exception ending goes away. So if you are working in a field where exceptions are seen as something to avoid, well, putting a try catch might make people feel uncomfortable, but with generic code, sometimes if you want to play it safe, you have no choice. In this case, implicitly, it's already dealt with. It's actually pretty neat. If there's any questions, Lucas, just get, uh, tell me, okay? So there are smart pointers. I just use a unique pointer, which is an awesome tool. There's others in the standard, but there's not that many. There's five right now, as far as I know, with C++20. And the, the main two are the first two. The other three are, are very specialized. You have unique pointer T which means I am the sole owner, the sole entity responsible for the point T. When I die, it dies with me. There are variations, of course. You can use a unique pointer of T square brackets that allows the square brackets notation on it and will delete with square brackets also. You have shared pointer T, which implements a shared semantics with respect to the point T. So you're copying the shared pointer, you're sharing the point T, which asks the question, uh, who's responsible in the end for destroying the point T? Well, the answer is the last entity which has been using it. So there's some internal counter management in there. It's very tricky code, but it's very nice. The other three are more corner case-ish. Weak pointer is used with shared pointer in some cycle creation code. I, I've never had to use it myself. And the atomic versions of the shared pointers are useful for log-free programming in very specialized, specialized cases, but they're very cool for that. Uh, Herb Sutter has a nice talk on this in the CVP code a few years back. So the big two are these two, those in both faces in this case. Most of the smart pointer users know these. You know? Uh, writing a unique pointer is not that difficult for the basic cases. Writing a shared pointer is quite tricky. Yeah, so it's pretty much what you need. So, so again, what we want is responsibility encoded in the type. That's the plan in this case, because raw pointers, nice as they are, they don't give us that. So these two already provides some information with respect to responsibility. We know that the unique pointer is the single owner, it's non-copyable, and when it is destroyed, it destroys the point T. So when you give it a pointer, it becomes responsible for it. For the rest, it kind of behaves like a pointer. It has the arrow operator, the uh, little um, star operator and stuff. Shared pointer implements share ownership. 
it shares the point T with others. It doesn't synchronize access to others, though, but it shares it. Uh, when you copy or assign or destroy a shared pointer, it updates a use count. And when the use count goes to zero, which is a bit of tricky but fun code, it destroys the point T. But recognizing that it goes to zero because of you requires a bit of, of familiarity with atomics. It's kind of fun to write. When I do that in class, uh, it's an interesting experience. So it's a restricted set of niches. There's only two really big niches in there. The other ones are much more specialized. But there are other niches that we could envision to, to make a, a, a more complete table in this case. You could have one that represents, well, I'm not an owner, and I behave like a reference to the point T, like something that tells you where it is, but I don't, I don't own it. That's actually pretty cool because you already know what it is. It's a T star. It's not smart, you'll tell me. Okay, maybe. But still, the intent these days of raw pointers on function interfaces is to mean you're not responsible for it. So if you're using a raw pointer in modern code, we don't expect you to take responsibility for it unless you're actually writing the constructor of a smart pointer or something. Yeah. There's, yeah, that's pretty much what it is for. You could also put it this way. Uh, there's a proposal that's been in the works for a few years called Observer Pointer. It has a number of names because some people don't like the Observer name because it reminds them of the Observer design pattern, which it has nothing to do with. In, the, in one of the original papers, there's this cute quote that names this the dumbest smart pointer of all because it has no responsibility whatsoever. But it's actually pretty neat. It's really useful. It's useful, why? It's useful. I, I gave a link if you want to look at it, but I can show you right away the code if you don't mind. It looks like this. Uh, it, it's a homemade one. So you see, it's an, uh, it's, well, it holds a P. Let's you access and use it using the basic operations like the arrow and the star and stuff. You can compare observer pointers, no problem. And that's pretty much it. You, know, you don't do anything because you're not responsible for it. You can swap, replace one or whatever, but you don't do much with it. It's a very simple class. Why? Well, what was the point in this case? Well, if you're getting as an argument to a function an observer pointer, you know there's no mistake to be made that you're not responsible for it. So you cannot call delete on it by accident, for example. It won't compile because it's not a pointer, it's an object. So you can do pointerish things with it, but encoded in the type is the fact that you're not responsible for it. Now, that's that might be a too, too thin a niche for a smart pointer. So that's one of the arguments against including it in the standard. I find it useful for my code, though. But, but it's not standard right now because it's not seen as useful enough, and there's, there's uh, arguments about the name. But still, we can do that. You can also have the, this nice case of you're not an owner, it behaves like a reference, but there's added semantics with respect to uh, what the, the, the object means. A nice example of that is, is non-null pointer. So you can write a smart-ish pointer that that's really just a pointer, but that by construction or by design offers you additional uh, resiliency factors, say. This one is interesting in the sense that when you have it, you know it's not null, because if it was null, it would not have reached you in the first place. The kind of code that you get, if you look at the upper side, the upper uh, area of the, uh, the box there, well, I'm getting a raw pointer, and I have code that expects it to be non-null, so I'm doing an assertion on it first, just to make sure. In the bottom part, I'm using a non-null pointer, I don't need to assert. If it was null, it would not have reached me. So my interface with the type that it's using encodes information with respect to the expectations. That's pretty neat. And it's not that hard to, to implement. I put one there that's also made available to you. The real point is, in this case, I used exception throwing. It could be something else. But I have this invalid class that I could throw if there's a problem. And when I construct in a null pointer from a raw pointer, if it's null, I do something to make sure it doesn't complete. It could be anything, it could be an assert, depends on how you feel. And the rest is just a thin layer over the raw pointer because past that point, you're okay. 
I'll go further, saying that once you have consumed a non-null pointer in your interface, you could just use a raw pointer underneath and play with it because you know you're OK. But uh, it documents at the boundary of your function what your expectations are. It's pretty nice. It removes checks, explicit checks from your code. So oh, far, so good. Please. Yeah, please. And there's a question. Cool. Um, why not use reference instead of observe? It really depends on where your, your information comes from. So when you have an object already <clears throat> and, and use references, but sometimes you know, you're playing with operating system resources and, and they are provided through pointers. Or sometimes you have an aspect based class of some kind and it's been given to you as a pointer. Or you're just, you don't want to dereference to, re, 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 to return to the address of afterwards when you already have a pointer in your hands. So yeah, but the, if the remark is you already can do so, most of these things with references, I totally agree with you. The, the, these are not standard because they might not be um, important enough for that. Mind you, non null in this case, there's a version in the uh, GSL, the guideline support library. So it's actually seen as useful by some people, but it's not a standard tool right now. I don't know if I'm answering correctly, Lucas. That, that's a that's wonderful fun. answer. Um, would you also touch on what it means to have the nullability, like I'm modeling my nullability in that case? Uh, you, you, well, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but with, with non-null, you will not have a nullable thing. You have a non-null thing by definition. In fact, you don't even have a default constructor because it would be null and you don't want that. But for example, observer point, if I understand correctly, right? It's like a reference, but it's also nullable. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it could be null, absolutely. Good point. So if you want to model that case, you could have an optional, you, can handle, you cannot have an optional reference because it's not in the language right now, but you can indeed have something that behaves kind of like an optional thing, but but with pointer semantics in this case. It's 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 a very simple tool, really. Me, mm -hmm. I use it when I just want to take a raw pointer in a function and I don't want to, I, I want my interface to make it clear that I won't be doing anything bad with it. I'm just going to be using it as a pointer, not taking ownership. It's a documentation tool, really. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, you're my pleasure. So the, the example is there if you want it. You can do weird things too. I put exotic semantics in there. I won't do the code for this one because it, it's tricky, but I've seen remote pointers that when you call a function, it calls a function on another machine and does the marshalling for you. So that exists. I think there's one in Boost or something. Uh, it, it's actually fun to write, but it's much trickier and much more involved because you're getting into communication stuff and it's not standards, so you end up with platform-specific tools and stuff. But you can envision, envision a, a smart pointer like this that, that represents the way, the, the fact that you're accessing a resource outside of your normal machine or process. You can have this thing, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So single ownership, but duplicates the point T when it is copied. <clears throat> There's Again, it's a limited use case, but the, the fun is to write it and see what, what it takes from us, what it requires from us. So destroys the point T when it's destroyed. So kind of like a unique pointer, but the unique pointer is not copyable. In this case, we'll do something that is copyable, and when it's copied, it duplicates the point T. You see, it's, it's, it's fun and it's interesting, even if it's a limited scope kind of thing. So this is, this is what we'll do, okay? But we'll just code the thing. So let's fill that small yet interesting niche. So what are the use cases? <clears throat> now, you, the use cases in this case is you, you, you want to take ownership and duplicate the point T when it's duplicated. So it's not unique pointer, unique pointer does not it's not copyable. And it's not shared pointer either, because shared pointer shares the pointy. That's not what you want. You want to be the single owner of something. Um, yeah, so it's kind of value-like semantics because you can copy and stuff. You're kind of the only responsible, the only owner of the point T, but sometimes there are things that you need to allocate dynamically. For example, uh, you have a private destructor. If you have a private destructor, you can only be created through new or some other mechanism because from the outside, we cannot uh, make a local variable of your type because it cannot be destroyed implicitly. So you need to allocate. And there are some weird things like that that exist. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, sometimes you need that. It's, it's, it's limited niche, but still. So one step at a time, okay? First, hey, there we go. 
So we got the framework for this. So based on a type, right, we have a dupe pointer, dupe for duplication, if you don't mind. I didn't try copy pointer because it's not necessarily copying as a return to. It's part of the interest of doing this. So it's going to be like this. It's a start. It's a start. Then you do that, you compile, and it works. You can, hey, I'm good. Then, well, we can say we'll put the pointer in there. Why not? It kind of makes sense. If you want to make a smart pointer to be the owner of an actual pointer that points potentially to a point T or something. So it will host a T star. If we if we keep that in terms of state in our object, no other member variables will have an interesting um, effect. It will mean that size of do pointer of T will be the same as size of T star. So there won't be any size overhead with respect to a row pointer. If you're doing things that uh, play with the cache or something, that's an interesting property to have because you're not incurring size overhead can actually make your program go a bit faster. So we'll try to keep it that way, but that will impose some restrictions on us. Yeah. Cool. We'd like that client code to work. So a main there that does a static assert stating that the size of a uh, dupe pointer of int, a default one, is the size of an int star. In order to be able to do this static assert, I need my uh, default constructor to be const expert. It needs to be a compile time thing. Uh, mind you, not even, you know, the size of, yeah. Uh, if I remove the braces, uh, I can do it at compile time without this, but I wanted to make it const expert. And then I create a default uh, do pointer event, and I make sure that it's empty because that's kind of what it means. It's a null pointer of sorts. So I'd like this to compile. If I go there, <clears throat> if you mind, uh, well, my default constructor in this case, uh, which is the first one under the public uh, public uh, colon thing, uh, it's const expert and it initializes p to null. So I'm getting part of what I wanted to do. I have this empty function that makes sure that I'm empty if my pointer is null. I, I don't mind the uh, bang p notation myself, so that's what I'm going to use. It's short term. I have the operator bool thing that says, well, I'm true if I'm not empty, which kind of makes sense. So that's pretty much the baseline of my thing. This code that I want to compile compiles with this. It's a pretty nice piece of work. It works. It's not doing what it's supposed to do yet, but I have something. So far, so good. Cool. Well, <clears throat> I could make it nicer. Um, one question, Wait, please? Yeah, please, please, please. Um, it's not entirely related, but uh, someone asks: Most container iterators implement operator deref and operator ampersand. Do you consider them smart pointers? Are they responsible for where they point to? That, that, that's really you a question. Answer? <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's really that's really a question to ask. So, mm -hmm. no, so, so they, they probably aren't because they're not meant to do that. One thing that you have to remember is that uh, you can implement the arrow and the, uh, the the star operators without being pointer like. It really depends on what you want to do. Uh, so, so, if you consider your your iterators to be responsible for what they point to, mind you, observer is not really responsible, but that's that's the only semantics it's providing. Uh, I, I, I see iterators myself as tools to go through a sequence, mostly. Uh, yeah. I, I, how could I say that? The, the fact that there are syntactic resemblances does not necessarily mean that you're, you want to convey the same semantics. So, so it can be used kind of the same way. It does not mean you wanted them to mean the same thing. We would have to ask the uh, designers of those things what they had in mind. I know that they wanted them to be syntactically similar to pointers, which is what they achieved, which is pretty cool. I don't know if they considered them smart, but yeah, it's an interesting question. I have to think about it. Thank you. Mm, another question just popped in. Cool. How about smart pointer type that enforces full const correctness? Can only be uh -huh. accessed as const, meaning as a const smart pointer must wrap a pointer to const. Uh, is the question, can we write that? Or I'm not sure. Maybe the person <laughs> can clarify, but let's assume the question is, can we write that? What do you think about it? Well, you, I, I, I don't know 
how useful that is because you already kind of get this uh, if if you're using uh, what would be the, the real thing. <laughs> Let me think about it and we'll come back to it, okay? Because I have to wrap my mind around what the question actually means. Uh, uh, it would mean that you're having a pointer that only lets you do non-modifying operations, kind of like a string view of sorts. So we have things like that in the standard. The, what would be the use of having a pointer that only does const stuff, don't, so is only readable, nothing else? It's like a construct or, some, or a construct of something. If we had uh, actual use cases or client code that would benefit from it, it would make it easier for me to think about it. So whoever wrote that function or wrote that question, try to prepare some kind of use case for me and we'll talk about it after the talk. Okay? Yeah. I'd like to see what you have in mind. Cool. Yeah, so we can make it simple by, by uh, doing non-static data member initialization with P there. I'm making sure that P is null by default and doing uh, the pointer by default is equals default in this case. So this gives me const expert for free. Well, it's kind of, kind of nice too. It makes for a slightly sh shorter code, so why not? So baseline, I'm still not duplicating anything. I'm still not responsible for anything really, but it's a start. You know? It works. If we want to take responsibility, at least first step, well, one thing you can do is actually accept a raw pointer as an argument to your constructor. So here, someone is providing you a raw pointer and saying it's yours now. So from now on, you're responsible for it. So it's reasonable to say a do pointer of int that takes a new int as argument. If the new fails, it doesn't matter for you. And if the new worked, you're being given that, you are by definition the responsible party now. So client code is not supposed to play with it except going through you afterwards. And my destructor there <clears throat> just deletes the thing. So this is the basic framework without duplication yet. It's something. Now, sometimes I see people wondering what, what do you do with delete if the pointer is null? Well, it's a no-op, so don't worry about it. So delete of a null pointer does nothing in C++. Doesn't done anything for years. We could do specialized uh, versions of this with uh, T square brackets. Say, I won't do it. It's fun to do if you want to try it, but there's a matter of time in a talk like this. Okay, But it's not that difficult to do. If we add that thin layer of pointer-like operations, now the, the dot, dot, dot thing that you see on the slide right now is what we've already done that I won't repeat, otherwise it will become very small on the screen. So the first two uh, functions that you see there are my dereference operators. Very simple as you can see. They're marked no except in this case, and sometimes people react saying, no except? What do you do if the pointer is null? If the pointer is null, it's not an exception. You won't get an exception. You'll get trouble because you're doing you're you're doing undefined behavior really. So it's not an exception you will you will do. I could validate there, but then I would incur overhead with respect to a raw pointer. Just don't do that. No? So no except is fine in this case, contrary to what some people think. <clears throat> so it's very thin. When I have a dot pointer ft and I dereference it, it dereferences the actual raw pointer inside. It was going to be in line, then you're going to get very thin code. Pretty neat. The arrow operator in this case, well, it just returns the pointer. Now that might be weird. If you've never done that, say, what, what's the meaning of these two functions? And why are they different? Well, they're different because one is const and one is not. That's fine. Um, but then the const is on the function, not on the return type. Uh, but but the, the, the const uh, after the parents applies to this, which is the difference in this case. So why does this work? Well because it's a bit of a magical thing. When you invoke the arrow operator on an object, it re-invokes the arrow operator systematically on what is being returned until it finds something it understands, a raw pointer typically in this case. So this allows you to do the same thing as you would with the arrow operator on the actual P object, if it exists. Now, if you're telling me, what if you have a doof pointer of int? Well, if you use the arrow on it, it won't compile. If you don't use it, you won't have any problem because you can have a function like this. If you don't call it, no problem whatsoever. So this actually works. It's pretty cool. So we still are not doing the duplication thing, but we have a framework. 
So we have actually a usable oversimplified, I agree, pointer wrapper that works with this. It's not duplicating, but the link there, it, it does work. And I'll give you an example of working code. It leads to this one, no observer, no, no, there we go. So if you look at what we've done, this is one box, compile C++20, but it's only C++ 11.14 code or something. So raw includes, simple stuff. IOStream is just for the output I'm going to show. Basic empty the pointer by default. One that takes ownership of a raw pointer. Destruction. Ways to test if it's empty or not. The basic pointer stuff. So as long as I'm not copying anything right now, I'm perfectly fine. And if I look at simple client code, I do a do pointer of string. It's a repository of string because I'm using CTAD, the class type argument deduction. So I don't have to write the pointer uh, angle bracket string angle bracket anymore since C17. And I'm using quoted to quote the string because there's a space in it. That's just standard stuff. And so you see, I'm doing the star thing there. I'm doing the arrow thing there through the pointer. And P dies there, though, star P dies there. And if you look at the code, just works. Pretty neat. So we have a working pointer right now. It's not duplicating, even though it's supposed to duplicate. We'll get to that. So far, so good. So now comes the point where we have to get to meet the things. We want a duplicating pointer, a duplication pointer. How do we duplicate the pointy? How do we do this? This is actually kind of fun. So th there's kind of two big flavors of duplication at the very least. One of them is copying. It's what we do in C++ most of the time because we don't play with pointers all that much. We play, play with objects. So normally when you're using objects directly, well, you use the copy constructor. So you have non-polymorphic things without virtual functions, uh, non-polymorphic objects. They could often be final because you don't expect anyone to derive from them because they have nothing to specialize, not having any virtual functions. And yeah, you just use them. You have a, clash, a cache object and you pass it around and it's cache. You have a string, you have a vector of something. It already has copying mechanisms built in and sign. But when you're playing with polymorphic objects with virtual functions, that doesn't work all that much, all that well. And so you're adding a pointer to some abstraction, and then you have derived classes. So you don't know, looking at the abstraction, which of the derived classes you're actually playing with. So how do you duplicate that thing if you don't know what it is? That's where cloning comes in, of course. So cloning, it's for polymorphic objects, things with virtual functions. It's things that you tend to handle indirectly through a reference or a pointer to something else than what you actually already see. So the static type and the dynamic type are different. And these types are typically conceived for extension purposes. So expect them to have derived classes. So it's kind of normal to expect them to be, uh, not to convey the entire set of information about the type because they're abstractions. We have a standard way to duplicate through copying. It's the copy constructor. Everyone who does C++ is at least passingly familiar with this. There's many ways to implement cloning because it's not the idiomatic C++ way of doing things. Uh, but it's not much better in other languages, to be honest. You have a clonable interface in Java, it works. You have a high clonable interface in C Sharp, it works too. But if you look at the recommendations for .NET code, they will tell you not to use high clonable because the semantics of the, the, the cloning are not uh, well specified. So you never know if you're doing shallow or deep copy with it. So it's kind of obscure. You should have documented the thing at first. So you have many homemade solutions to the cloning problem or you just write immutable objects and be done with it. <clears throat> because if you don't need to mutate things, you don't need to make copies of it. So yeah, there's many ways to do that. So this, this one that you see there, it's doing copy. So that int with a big I on the left, well, it's a very, very simple int wrapper, you know? And if you look at modify locally, which takes an int reference, it makes a backup on the first line. So that makes an actual copy of the int. It changes the end of the original int with a big I, outputs it, 
and returns the copy that has the old value because it's not a shared semantic, it's a copy semantic. So in the first line of main, n is zero. When you pass x to modify locally, it changes that object and displays one, but returns the old value in this case, which I display afterwards in, in main and displays zero. So that's copy. It's rather simple and it's what most of us do day to day in C++. You, you can see that's probably not something you will want to inherit from or derive from with int. It has no virtual functions to specialize, so it wouldn't make a, big, a good abstraction for derived classes in the first place. It would be questionable to inherit from it, maybe, maybe privately or something. <clears throat> this is different. See, image as virtual functions. It, isn't, it even has a per, per, pure virtual function, which is display. It's an abstract one. <clears throat> and I have PNG there, a PNG. That, that is an image with its own specialized display uh, function. It's very really cool, it displays pnngs. Main does a new pnng at the bottom uh, right end and uses it through an image pointer because Im uh, a PNG is an image. It passes that image pointer to modify locally, which returns the image pointer and does, then does display. So the idea is, is here is kind of like in the previous one, but with abstractions. The first line of modify locally won't compile. It's trying to do some sort of copy construction of the point T, but it won't compile because image is abstract. It has an abstract function, which is display. So you cannot do a new image. So you won't, you won't get along with it. So this code that you might have wanted to make work, it won't compile at all because you cannot do a new image. Okay, it won't work. Now, if you say, well, I'm gonna remove that problem, I'm going to make display a non-abstract function. There, put a pair of braces. Now it compiles, but it's incorrect. Because if you look at the first line of modify locally at the right end, auto backup is a new image of star x. Well, it so happens that the point T is not an image, it's a PNG. If you look at main, that's what it is. Because you're using it through an abstraction, but by doing a new image of star x, you're chopping everything that is properly a PNG. So any data member that's inside PNG about that an image has been cut off in this case. It's called slicing, it's very bad. So it would compile, but it's actually worse than the one that didn't compile because it breaks your code. That's pretty mean, you yeah? So in those cases, when you're using an object through an abstraction and want to make a copy of whatever is really pointed, it, pointed by it, that's where cloning comes in. So yeah, we need cloning. So when you have this, there's many ways to do cloning, of course. <clears throat> One of the ways to do this is to have a virtual clone member function that duplicates the most derived object, so the child classes implement the thing and typically a protected copy constructor because it will be used internally by clone to duplicate the object. Copy constructors do that well. We don't, you don't want the outside world to call it because while well, they're going to be using an abstraction and calling the copy constructor is probably a bug. See, so protected inside is not a bad idea. There's many other ways to do this, of course. Sorry for the noise. So if we want to do this, yeah, it's a smaller slide, but see an image on the upper left, you have a protected copy constructor and a abstra an abstract clone function that is specialized in PNG. You could, uh, if you're not familiar with it, you could uh, notice in this case that the return types are not the same. Image clone returns an image star. PNG clone returns a PNG star. That's fine. C++ allows for covariant return types in such cases. It's pretty neat. So this, this actually works. And if you look at modify locally in this case, when you're calling clone on an image pointer, since the image pointer in this case uh, dynamically points to a PNG because of the calling code, which is main, well, you're gonna call the clone from PNG and you're gonna get an image pointer in, in, in backup because you're using it through an image star, but still it's a PNG and you've done your work properly. It works when it leaks, by the way. You might have noticed, or not, I don't know, that modify locally leaks right now. Think about it. So even with such simple cases, we can see that there might be use for our dupe pointer in such a case, because it might be doing a better job than just a raw thing in this case, which leaks. I'm leaking one of the images. 
Okay, so let's return to our smart pointer. Did you not see it? Look at the slides afterwards, it's fun. And so the problem is, yeah, please, yeah. my friend, go ahead, go ahead. Why can't we mark the copy assignment or copy construction uh, um, operator as virtual? Uh, you never have virtual constructors in C++ because you always know what you're constructing. So virtual functions are when you are using an abstraction to call something that's more specialized. And when you want to simulate uh, virtual constructors in C++, you're writing a factory function. Okay, thanks. Think, if you think about it, you do new of a type, so it's that type and nothing, nothing else. So you're kind of stuck with it. Is that an okay answer? Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's an interesting question, but it's uh, it's a long-standing problem. Constructors are typically the one moment where you actually know what you're doing. After that, you can have lots of abstractions, but when you're constructing, you know what you're constructing. So yeah, the problem space is this one. So you have the objects that can be copy constructed. You have objects that you will want to duplicate through cloning, and there might be other cases that we've not seen. So so we, we kind of need an escape hatch of sorts for these bits of code that don't fit into those basic families of duplicating uh, operations. This is what we want to target. OK. There's no such thing as a standard clonable interface in C++. So we, we, can, we can suppose one, and we can write one, but there's no standard one. It's not hard to write. We could write our own. Uh, I will do it today. So, so the basic idea of what we're going to do, since we have at least two ways of doing things, copy construction, cloning, and maybe others, we're going to encode in uh, types these operations, what it means to copy, what it means to clone, and leave the door open for other objects that do something else. And then we're going to pick the right strategy depending on the properties of type T. So if T is trying to duplicate something that is clonable, it will clone it. If, it, if not, it's going to try to copy it. And we'll leave a hole open for users to inject other ways of duplicating things. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. Our function objects, that's why we're going to be using function objects for this. So a cloner, a copier, I'll show them in a second. And we'll presume them or suppose them to be stateless. Why is that? So without any data member inside. Because we don't want to store them. Okay. If we make them stateful in a dupe pointer of t, we're going to have to add the stateful object inside the dupe pointer and then wonder what we do when we duplicate that duplicating object. So it will complicate logic a bit. It will make our pointer bigger. That could be done, mind you. But I'm going to avoid that subject and presume them to be stateless. So only functions, no data members. This way, I'm going to keep that nice property that the dupe pointer of t is the same size as a t star. Fair enough. These will be my basic uh, duplicating uh, function objects. So copier does a copy. It takes a pointer to a T and do a, does a new T with it. My cloner will take a pointer of T and do clone on it. Now you might notice that I'm not validating that P is non null. I'm going to consider that as a precondition to keep the code simpler. So these will be my two basic duplication mechanisms. So far, so good. Simple code. Cool. Uh, yeah, we can add others as long as we have the same interface. So as long as we have something that takes a const t star and returns a t star, we can add other stuff than this. I'm going to have examples of that later. So precondition p is not null. Now, the, the, the real trick here is how we're given type T, how do we pick the right duplication mechanisms uh, for our needs, for our tools? Uh, and how do we make sure that the client code can put something else if it prefers? Now, th this is the basic structure, see? So I have T and I have, let's call it dupe or D, depending on the slide, sometimes I just use D. So dupe will be my duplication object. So that dot, dot, dot thing, right now it's not real code, it's pseudocode. It's where I'm going to put my selection mechanisms. I'm going to look at three different ones with you to show you options to do this. From the, uh, uh, as I go along, it's going to be simpler, but more, more modern, it's going to use modern tools. Inside that public segment there, well, when I will need to duplicate my pointer, my dupe pointer, I'm going to use dupe as a way to duplicate star p. But that's going to be the same thing in all cases, it's going to be either a copier or a cloner or something else. 
there's the cat on me. So if you hear meow, it's because one of my cats is there. So that dupe thing is what is sometimes called a policy class. If you look at uh, Alexandrescu's modern C++ book from the 1990s or early 2000s, uh, you'll see that name come up. And we're not going to store it. I'm going to presume it to be stateless. So how do we pick the right type there? So one thing we could do is say, well, suppose there's a clonable interface in our code. If it's your company's code base, that's perfectly fine. You might have a clonable interface that everyone is expected to inherit from. Why not? So if such as the case, you can say, well, if T is a clonable, if it inherits clonable, then we clone. Otherwise, we copy. So let's suppose this is the way we want to go with this. We could have such a clonable interface. So you see, it's a public class that has a uh, abstract clone function that the uh, derived classes are expected to implement, a virtual destructor to make sure that the cleanup is proper, and protected default and uh, copy constructors to make sure that we can actually write derived classes nicely. So this would be the interface that we would need to implement. Fair? Okay, it's not standard, something you could have. So one, th one way to do this is what you see. <clears throat> so dupe in this case, I'm using conditional T, which I I'll explain in a second. And I'm saying, well, if clonable is base of T, which is what you see there with the trait, I'm using type traits, standard code. So is base of V, C++ 17, but there's other ways to do this. It's saying it's true if T as clonable as base. So if clonable is a base of T. If th this is true, I'm picking cloner. If it's false, I'm picking copier. So conditional T in this case, it's a static if on types, really. It takes a condition that is true or false, know that compile time, that's important. In this case, it's a relationship between types, so it's compile time only. And the two types, cloner and copier, are the things I'm going to pick, either one or the other. So I'm choosing a dupe between these two based on the condition. So far, so good. Cool. Conditional T has this form, condition true false. So it's kind of like T, uh, the, the, the type, the, the whole type conditional T of blah, blah, blah. It's T if con is true, else F if con is false. So it's a compile time if, as I said, on types, not on values. You can write your own if you feel like it. So this is a homemade conditional. I used to write it myself before we had the standard trait. So as you can see, you have the basic thing, bool class class, that is an incomplete type, first line. Then you have your special specialization with true, tf, that picks t because the boolean is true. You have the other specialization that says false tf, that picks f because the boolean is false, with pattern matching at compile time. Templates do that very well. And in the end, there's this alias conditional t to make writing code simpler because otherwise you have to put type name, colon, colon, type every time you use that thing, like we used to do in the past. So that's pretty much what it looks like. It, there's other ways to do it, of course. So if you look at this, it's pretty nice. So we're picking a default duplication strategy for T based on what T is, what its properties are. Then if our default selection does not suit client code, client code can pick something else could supply explicitly a dupe as long as it fits the needs of the use case. But we're providing some defaults for most cases there. Is that okay? Okay. So this is unidiomatic in the sense that we're imposing an interface. So I wouldn't standardize something like this. It's not the C++ way of doing things. There are languages that do that. I disposable, I clonable, but C++ imposing intrusive things such as interfaces, ugh, it's not really the, 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 the manners in which we do things in C++. But for a company, for a non-standard code, like local code, it's perfectly fine. Another way to do this is say, well, let's, let's then impose an interface. If T has a const member function named clone, so we're, we're sticking to the name there, then we clone. We're going to suppose that clone clones. Otherwise, we copy. So if we if we do it this way, instead of inspecting at compile time the code to see if there's a specific interface, we're going to inspect for a specific function. Why not? This is the actual whole code for this. It's really a bit smaller, so let's take it one step at a time. 
The first version uh, on top, just in, be just underneath the include there. It's as clone, which is by default false. So false type is in type traits. It's a type that represents the concept of being false. Its value is false. It's distinguishable for, from true type, which is true. So by default, as clone is false. Let's see it this way. The class equals void there is a trick. The second specialization there, has clone, uses void t. So t colon void t, and there's this weird thing that I'm going to explain. So look at this strange line. It's beautiful, really. It, it looks strange, but it's beautiful. Void t is, is a piece of, of, of art from uh, Walter Brown. <clears throat> Uh, when he presented that at CPCon 2014, if I remember, he had a sending ovation with this. It's something that lets you dis um, discover or verify or assert or whatever, uh, ensure that a type, a specific expression is legal. So look between the, uh, in the middle of the, the angle brackets of void t to see declaration type of something. And inside the little type, you have an expression. Decalval of const t star, call, uh, parent parent, arrow clone. What we're trying to express here is if I have a const t star, an hypothetical const t star, should it exist? Doesn't have to. And I call clone on it, does it make sense? That's the way to read this thing. So if I have a const t star and I call clone on it, does the expression make sense? If it makes sense, the, that lower thing will be selected and true type will be associated with as clone. If it doesn't make sense, the first one will work. It will pick false type. So it lets me pick between two things based on an expression, an arbitrary expression in this case, without ever constructing any T or, or whatever. I, I, I'm going to go back to this. Then you have this const explorer shortcut as clone v, just to make code simpler, to avoid having to type as clone t colon colon value, which is uh, quite a mouthful. And then I'm using conditional again. If it has clone, as clone v of t, I'm picking cloner. Otherwise, I'm picking copier. It's much, it's a bit more work, but it's much less intrusive than, than imposing an interface on types, because now it works with just about anything. Void T, it's a brilliant piece of work. You can look at it. I put the link there on the, on the CP reference. It lets you detect a number of cool things. It's very simple code. It's it's stupendous. Uh, Patrice, on this Please. slide, uh, there's a question. <laughs> yeah, of Why course. do we check for clonable, but not check for copyable? Because uh, I, the, the supposition in this case is that copy is the default. So, so things are copyable in general. If it's not, if you try to copy something that's not copyable, it won't compile at all. So if you remove the copy constructor, you delete it, it won't compile. So the, the point is, in this case, that if you have something that is uh, polymorphic and you want to go through other means than the usual way of doing things, then you clone or provide something else. The supposition in this code is that by default, you have concrete types and then copy does the job. Is that an okay answer? Mm -hmm. That's and, good. Uh, you can write a copyable class, by the way, struct, copyable, brace, brace, semicolon. It works fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another question. Can't we do that void star, void t thing with concepts now? Yeah, I will. I will in a second. I'm, I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. Promise. Is that cool? So void t is still, it's still nice to, to show because it's a beautiful piece of work. So decal val there. <clears throat> It's a non-function. The, the whole code is at the bottom of that, that uh, orange square there. You, you have it all. There, there's no implementation. It's a function that makes it look like you have a T. So uh, the way to see declaration val is if I had a T, in this case, a const T star, and then, and then I can do anything with it, I'm calling clone there. If that thing exists, so it, 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 won't, it won't give you anything because it doesn't exist, but it lets you reason based on the expressions that you have. So declaration type of that weird thing is what, does that type make sense in, in sort of a way? So it's a non-function, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so we're validating to see if you can have a clone function in a const t star and call it. If your clone is non-const in this case, it probably won't compile or something. Yeah, so this is one way of doing this. Uh, so in, uh, as I was saying, instead of imposing a basic interface on everyone, I'm, I'm looking for a specific signature of a function, say. 
And as your uh, your participant just mentioned, well, you could that, do that with a clonable concept today, which is actually pretty cool. If you have a recent compiler, though. So yeah, you can define a clonable concept. It's even nicer. So it looks like this. <clears throat> so in this case, I'm saying for a type T, clonable is satisfied if. That's the requires that you see. If given a const T star P, I call P, P arrow clone on it, and the return type is something that is convertible to a T star. This is pretty much what I had in mind when I wrote this. So that makes for a very nice code if you look at it. It's, I think it's straightforward. It's nice to read. And you can do conditional T again on clonable of T, pick cloner or pick copier. It's pretty neat, but, but you need a recent compiler for that. I did include concepts because I'm using std colon colon convertible to. It's in the concepts editor that you will see this thing. I love C20. So this this is a much simpler way of achieving the same same kind of effect indeed. Uh, yeah, it reads well and it checks the return type and everything. Okay, so we have this. Do it this way too. A look at the difference. Instead of let's go back for a second. The one that I have here is saying dupe is, if I'm clonable, it's cloner, otherwise it's copier. But I can still supply something else for dupe in this case. If I think that I'm only going to have copyable and clonable things, I could do it this way instead. So I have two specializations of dupe pointer. The first one that requires clonable of T, and the second one that says requires not clonable of T. This actually makes for two full implementations where do pointer can just do the job itself without relying on a policy class. You can just implement everything because it knows in the first case that it's a clonable one, in the second case that it's a non-clonable one. But that does not leave as well the room open for more exotic ways of duplicating. So I'm going to keep the one that uses dupe, if you don't mind. Is that okay? C++ when it changes everything, it's so cool. I was having a discussion with Lucas earlier saying, we are adding too much stuff in the language. Yeah, but concepts are really cool. <laughs> okay, so the, 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 we're gonna keep the previous version. It's a bit safer for us. Now, if client code, that the, the last, uh, the last um, um, bit at the bottom, what if client code has something else than clone and copy? Well, in this case, the, the idea here is to leave the door open for supplying uh, duplication mechanisms that the client has selected, quite simply, or defined. So this, this exotic thing, so look at the left part in boldface. I have this exotic thing called exo. I used to write exotic, but it didn't fit well in the slide. It has the private copy constructor but you can duplicate it using uh, the duplicate function. But it's not called clone, it's called duplicate for whatever reason. I'm not judging, it's, it's there. So to make a copy of an exo, I have to call duplicate, and my default objects don't do that. Well, so look at the right side now. In my main, <clears throat> or, or something else, somewhere else, I can make a, a duplicator. I call that exo dupe in this case. That calls duplicate. And I can make a dupe pointer of exo, Call a uh, comma exo dupe, and then I have a uh, dupe pointer that will duplicate using the, me the mechanisms provided by exo dupe. So it's that simple. So someone who is using something else in the busy mechanisms can do so. Questions about this? Is that okay? Okay. And then if you, another way to do this would be this. Uh, I thought uh, about putting this in case people would find it fun. So duplicate there in this case is a function that returns a lambda. And I'm using the declaration type of that uh, function there. Uh, uh, it, could, it should be duplicator, duplicator parent parent uh, at the bottom, I should fix this. So if I call duplicator, missing the parents, <clears throat> what it returns is what I'm going to be using as a, dupli as a duplication device. That works too. So there's a missing pair of parents on line uh, on slide uh, 119. There. So when we put it all together, we want to have a workable working solution. Okay. So the point again is responsibility over the point T. So it intervenes in these six functions really, and mostly in two of these. 
So this is our desired specific one, the, the special ones. So these two, copy constructor and copy assignment, are those we care for in this case. We'll look at the others too by out of principle, but they're not the main point. So, so uh, I'm going to be using the copy and swap idiom. So if you're not familiar with it, I'm going to write assignment using the copy constructor and swap. The swap will look like what you see on the screen right now. It's a pretty common idiom in C++. If you want to know more, just write to me. So there. We've already done these two. The default constructor and destructor we add at the beginning. They've been there for a number of slides now. They look like this. So default constructor makes sure that the, the pointer is a null pointer of sorts, and the destructor just deletes the point T because that's what the meaning was in the first place. Move operations are a bit simple in this case because I have decided that my duplication objects are stateless, so I don't have to uh, to move them or copy them. So it makes semantics easier. So I just want really to move the pointer in this case. Yeah, if I decided to have stateful the objects, I would need to think about it a bit more. So the code is just this three. Uh, and for my, my move constructor, I use exchange. If you're not familiar with exchange that you will find in utility, you really should get familiar with it, especially if you're writing move, move operations, it's a beauty. So exchange, really what it says in, in this case, if you look at the one to third line in the uh, orange bit of code, it's saying p becomes what other that p used to be, and other that p becomes null pointer. It's like you have a sequence of assignments from right to left. And the move assignment, it creates a do pointer with the moved contents of other, which cleans up other, which is what we wanted, and swaps it with me in such a way that afterwards I have what used to be an other, and that object there is as my old stuff, which will die at the closing brace. It's a very simple, quite efficient way of doing this. It's very idiomatic and very clean. Questions about this? That's fine. Okay. So with what we want to do, the duplication mechanisms now. <clears throat> this is the, the, the meat and bones of this thing. So we won't try to duplicate null pointers because it's a precondition that we don't use null pointers with the objects that we defined. That was the point. Yeah. So this is what we'll get. It's not much code if you look at it. Look at the copy constructor. So it's saying P, well, <clears throat> if the other one is empty, P is null. Otherwise, otherwise, what do I do? I instantiate a dupe. So dupe brace brace means give me a dupe. And I apply that to other.p, which will duplicate it in the way that it's meant to be duplicated. So it will use whatever policy has been provided there to copy, clone, or otherwise duplicate the point T. And the assignment is just a basic copy and swap assignment like we often do in practice. It's boilerplate code, really. So the key thing is the selection of a dupe object. Once that is done, the rest is pretty much straightforward. Yeah. There. The full code is there. It's already available for you. It's uh, available there too. I put for you all, and I won't read through all this, an entire thing with concepts. So if you want to play with the code and you're not using a C++ 20 compiler, comment the concept related line, of course and lines, and I put the basic duplication objects one close to the other, and I put three namespaces so that you can play with it and have fun. So v0 is the first one with the clonable interface. That's there, let's pass. The second one uses void t, which you see there. The same is pretty much straightforward. And the third one uses concepts. I also took the liberty of putting client code to make sure that we can see how it works. So let's just move at the client code there that is available for you, so just we understand. I did an x0 that is a clonable thing and abstract with an update function such that I can modify it along the way. Print it for test purposes. I put the virtual print function in there. I made the derived class from it, in, uh, in which I put an int and changed it. 
It's the only thing I do with it. So the X0, Y0 is for the V0 thing that uses the clonable interface. Because it has an intrusive thing, it's different from my other use cases. That's why they have different names. And my X1, Y1s, they don't have to have an interface in it. So I can just rely on the clone function, which means that there are different types of it. Intrusive code is a bit annoying, but for the rest, it's pretty much the same thing. It's clonable, so I have copyable stuff and clonable stuff in this case. It's a full example. The test that makes a copy, line 242, using the duplication mechanism that I have. So if it's a clonable do pointer or a do pointer that clones, it will clone. If it's a do pointer that copies, it will copy. I display P and other first, then I modify and I display them again to show that there's been a modification to one, but not to the other. I have a main there that's doing things on copyable objects, hence things on clonable objects, Y0s and Y1s, depending on the dependency or not on an interface, which shows that it works in all cases, if you look at the bottom. Pretty neat. For your uh, enjoyment. If you find bugs, of course, write to me. <laughs> I, I, I'd be surprised, but it could happen. We can always miss me and make mistakes. Do more, of course. We could, as I said, cover the array of T case, uh, add relational operators, uh, have co covariant constructors, like constructing a dupe pointer of a base from a dupe pointer of a child class. It's not that hard, but at some point we only have an hour to work with. So what did we do with this? Well, Again, in C++, we don't need to use pointers all that much, but sometimes we do, and raw pointers are fine, and they're useful, but we have unclear responsibilities, as I was saying at the beginning, so we tend to encapsulate them in vectors or strings or whatever handle types that we have. The key of smart pointers is that the responsibility is encoded into the type, which gives us clearer purpose and asks us to write less documentation in our code. We have a few standard ones, they're good. Unique pointer is a work of art. It's a beautiful piece of code. Shared pointer is tricky. You shouldn't use it all that much. It's a very specific niche, but for that niche, it's doing a very good job. It's tricky to write though. Don't write your own, it's, it's a tricky one. To, uh, write your own if you wanna have fun, but it's a tricky piece of work. We can do other smart pointers. We did one today, do pointer. Well, we, we coded it for fun. Well, I did. I don't know if you had fun. I did. Uh, I had a use case in mind, though. You just don't write code to write code. You have to have a goal of some kind, of some sort. Now, uh, a warning, not because the, the fact that there's a niche left uncovered doesn't mean we should standardize a solution for it. We might need a solution for our use cases, uh, for our company's use cases. But maybe for the standard, it's not the right fit. So maybe I've done something here. I'm not sure I would propose something like that for a standard, unless I had a real important use case that I think everyone must might face at some point and we need a solution for. Sometimes it's too narrow in each, really. And sometimes, well, it's not a standard level quality solution that we have. If I take the first one I had today, um, imposing an intrusive clonable interface on everyone it just wouldn't fly. I wouldn't try that on the standard committee meeting. It would get shouted out. The people wouldn't let me do something like this. And they would be right. It's not what we expect from standard level code. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. We had interesting properties. Uh, we, 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 we deduced, inferred a D type for the most common cases, which means that with the pointer that we did, people can actually come out and use it for reasonable code out of the box. We covered the atypical cases because there's a way to do something else at the default, but the default works nicely. And provided that we stick to stateless duplicating mechanisms, well, we don't incur any size overhead. So it's not bad code, really. it's kind of nice. The deduction of a policy class is the trickiest part in this case. So, but there's many ways to do that. There's more than what we did today. We can impose an intrusive type relationship 
which might be okay in many languages. It's just not the C++ way of doing things, at least at the standard level. We can detect the validity of expressions using void t or some other ways. Void t just, is just a very nice way of doing it. And we can detect that we conform to a concept, which is pretty cool. So t satisfies clonable. You can find other ways to do that too. Like you can find other ways to do cloning. There's ways using CRTP and stuff. Yeah, so it was fun doing, and I hope you had fun too. There we go. Well, well thank you very thank much, you very for, much the for the talk. My pleasure. pleasure. Um, uh, it was wonderful uh, having you. Uh, there are some uh, questions. Uh, um, yeah. uh, maybe a tricky, tricky one for the start. Regarding conversions between pointers, how does dynamic cast interact with smart pointers? Um, th there, there are specialized functions for that that I almost never use. But there's a static pointer cast and a dynamic pointer cast. I think you should look into them. Um, if you want to use the raw pointer inside the smart pointer, you can typically call a get function that gives you the raw pointer and then do all the casts that you want on them as long as you don't take responsibility for the pointy. Okay, for those specialized casts, I don't want to say anything that's wrong because I've never used them. I never had a need for them. So there. I can tell you that if you don't have a get function for your smart pointer for some reason, I didn't implement one with the one I had today, you can always, always do p, p dot operator arrow parent parent. It will give you the, essentially the same thing as a get. So you can always access the raw pointer from, uh, oh, congratulations, Katarina. Well, there. Okay, so, so again, I'm listening. Sorry, did, did I answer correctly? I'm not sure if there is a, a correct or wrong answer. I think you well, gave a wonderful answer, so thank you for that. Um, maybe a bit of heckling now. There's someone noticed something on your Wandbox example and thinks you made a, you, you missed something. Oh. Um, it didn't add a template parameter deleter, or did I miss it? We, we could do that. The problem when you have more than one policy is the order. What is the proper order uh, if you want some of them to be deduced or inferred and specialize others? So if you have two policies, well, if you put the later second, but it's the one that people want to control, well, you, they end up having to explicitly specify that they want cloning or copying because you want to put the data at the end, but it's totally feasible. In practice, what I noticed when I use policies, I don't use policies all that much. For smart pointers, it's cool. Uh, when you add too many policies, it, became, it becomes a bit cumbersome to use. So you have to make wise choices. Uh, you have a custom data in a shared pointer, if I don't really, if I remember properly, and you have one in, um, in unique pointer. In unique, in unique pointer, it really makes sense because uh, in unique pointer, the only thing it does is destroy the thing at the end. So uh, if you want to, Call release on a DirectX resource instead of calling delete on a, a pointer that you own. It's it's fair to to let you do that. 